the more blocks that we release to the presence of that integrity, yeah. the easier yeah. it is for us to establish a greater conscious awareness of all of the yeah. guidance that's around us. And so yeah. maybe that guidance is always there, but we don't see it. We're not capable of being able to even witness it. Gabrielle Bernstein, a role model for spiritual seekers. What happened to me when I decided to be upfront about sexual abuse and as it, mine took place in the context of really intense religious uh, insanity. So I came I came out and told that whole story in a book. And what I lost was everything. <laughs> I didn't lose my children. I lost um, my home. I was living in Utah. I was raised Mormon. So I lost my family of origin. I lost my, in terms of them not speaking to me anymore, lost all the friends I'd ever had growing up, lost my job, lost my, left my profession. Um, it just ever it came out as gay. I mean, I realized I was gay. I was not a closeted gay person, but I fell in love with a woman. And uh, so there went my marriage and everything went into the fire. And still I felt better, more healed, more whole than I had before. And what I want to tell people is, look, if I can survive that level of loss, I think you can survive whatever happens to you because most people won't have that much backlash so mm -hmm. that's why i told the story to say look this is the worst it gets and it's still worth doing go girl yes <laughs> I, I i really appreciate that i also think that that uh this let's go right into the metaphysical here i think that sometimes when our soul makes the contract to come back in this life in this way in this mm. life, in this time we part of that contract is i'm going to go through certain suffering so that i could live yeah. to tell and be the teacher be the messenger be the coach to to show people one yes here are the practices for recovery and 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 resilience but also to to really be a power of example for people who are living in that because yeah. i for myself when i i actually dissociated from the trauma and sure. uh, so talk about talk about lying right like uh, i was like my brain my brain my body everything yeah. was lying for 36 years wow um, hiding lying until i remembered and yeah. in that memory i remember people it was women like you and in the mm. truth of your story and in the uh and in the witnessing of your resilience that gave me permission and the freedom to believe that there was light on the other side. Wow. And they just kind of, let's just go into that kind of metaphysical conversation. I mean, do you believe that you in any way kind of chose this life? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, it, I even go a step more because I was so, I felt so separated from the world that I, and so afraid of people yeah. that I never actually identified really strongly with being human. I felt, and I read when I was, in my 20s about how trauma in rats permanently alters their brains and they have different neural function. And I was like, oh my gosh, I am completely ruined and there's no way back. But then I started thinking maybe it's made my brain different in good ways. Mm. And so, I, and I think it did. I think powerful disassociation makes you more prone to seek the spiritual, to seek that which is not physically visible. There's a connection with an energetic flow through the world that I don't think we would have had if we hadn't undergone so much trauma that we split from our bodies for a little while totally, and maybe for years. So I actually see it as the soul, not just wanting to help others, but the soul wanting to evolve in its own compassion. I talked to a South American shaman once who said, compassion is the evolution of consciousness in the healing of trauma. Mm. And so to the extent that you've experienced trauma and you heal it, you become more, you, you're able to access much more compassion. And, and sometimes it's, compa it's the heart as wide as the world sensation, like you've been completely shattered, then be shattered open. And so not just for other people, but for your soul's own sake, you now have access to so much compassion and the suffering doesn't, doesn't last, but the compassion does. Yeah. Right on. That's, that's, that's so, that's, that's such a beautiful way to look at it. And I also, you know, I study, um, I'm studying uh, parts, parts therapy. I'm studying. IFS. Oh yeah. I'm oh, I'm in that. Oh yes, you are. <laughs> I got so excited that I got myself an IFS therapist and I love it. 
It, you know, I think that, I think that it's, it, for me personally, I can just say it's been some of the most transformational trauma recovery of work, really, really all work I've done work in my, my marriage work with my team, you know, it's just, mm. it's, it's exceptional. Um, and for people who are like, what is that? We did a, we did an episode with where I interviewed Dick Schwartz. So people can go back and listen to IFS right now. But, um, what I w was going to say about that was that one of the things that I really appreciate so much about that model is that there are no bad parts. And so right. even the part that dissociated in, in my case, in your case, um, you, you know, it, it was really there to protect us from, from, from what we were capable of handling in that moment. Um, for 100%. me, I'm a recovering addict, you know, it's like that the, the addicted part was, was, was a protector and had a really yep. important role. And so yeah. when we can really see not only uh, the experience of trauma, but also all of the ways that we responded to it with so much compassion, then yeah. we can, we can move through it. We can, we can become new from it. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think it's, it's interesting. You, you, you said something that was really important, which is we have these uh, opportunities when we dissociate to have a, have a deeper seeking and longing for a spiritual connection. And I really appreciate what you said, because I think in some clinical places, it could be seen as like spiritually bypassing, you know, to like mm, sure. try to get above the pain and the suffering. But I never really thought that to be true. I think that spirituality without the deeper work could be perceived in that way. But, when, but, but when there's a spiritual anchor, it is, it is part of the, the guidance to the deeper work. Because yeah. I know for myself, I couldn't have done the deeper work. I couldn't have gone to the places that scared me without that spiritual faith and foundation. hundred um, percent. Yeah. 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 I mean, even right now I've got this kitten who's chewing on my, I had to bring her into the show. I mean, she's going to, this is Jimmy blue who you've met and <laughs> she's going to have to be on the show from now on because she just wants to be with me. And I, Aww. um, and it's the biggest blessing. And I got this kitten, um, just, just two months after I lost a baby, I lost a baby two months ago. Um, I, had, I was five months, five and a half months pregnant. Oh, yeah, it was rough. And, um, it's so fascinating when you go through something and then you just witness the spiritual guidance of, okay, yes, you have your therapist. Yes, you have your, um, you know, your, your team, whatever it is, but then, you know, these beings, these, 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 these spiritual beings come to us yeah. in many forms yeah. in some, in some cases, physical forms like this. Mm, yeah. So I'd love to hear from you just a little bit about what that means to you, what it means to you to have spirit guides, or if you have faith in angels or let's go there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, one of the interesting things about IFS or parts therapy is that you just, the, the therapist, at least my therapist is so non-invasive. They just say, look at your inner landscape and tell me what you see. And my inner landscape, you know, is just completely populated with wild animals and spirit guides. And, and I don't tightly hold any belief. I think loosely attaching to something and letting it go immediately when it turns out not to feel true or to be destructive. That's really the key to navigating the world. Just don't attach too tightly to anything mm. except your own sense of truth, yeah. which is always giving you feedback. So one of the things that happens when you decide to come out of denial or come out of hiding and be completely in integrity, which just means being one thing whole and intact is that you start to encounter the spiritual aspects of your life. And our culture doesn't really entertain that or it entertains it only in very religious ways. Right. But the ways it comes up are like anybody out there, if you close your eyes and you go inward and try to see what the inner landscape of your world is, pretty soon you're going to start seeing things that are loving and caring and beautiful that never came up in school, but they show up a lot when people go inward, which is not what we're trained to do. So I think the whole world is absolute. I think the universe is conscious. I think everything is conscious. And when we're ready to come out of denial, we meet with a spiritual teacher of some kind. I write about this in my book. Yeah. There's when you say I'm ready to go through whatever it takes to be true to myself, to be whole, the universe or in Joseph Campbell's um, typology of the hero saga, the, the spiritual teacher shows up and it's very often an animal for me. Sometimes it's books. A lot of times it's books. Yep. Uh, sometimes it's a literal person who will just call me on the phone 
happens more and more lately. I was, you know, studying Jill Bolte Taylor's work. She's a Harvard neuroanatomist who had this massive stroke and recovery. The coolest story. It's a cool story. Oh, yeah, tell the story so just good. for anyone who hasn't heard it. It's such a fascinating Yeah, story. okay. The first TED talk that ever went viral and watch it and you'll see it. it's fascinating. This is a woman who's like clawed her way up the Harvard ladder to being uh, at the top of her field in neurological anatomy, anatomy of the brain. And at the age of 37, she has a massive left hemisphere stroke, which takes out all her verbal capacity and obviously a lot of other, leaves her with a lot of other shortcomings. She didn't even recognize her own mother. Um, but it took out the left side of her brain, which is the part that feels fear and the part that controls and talks. The right side of the brain feels curiosity rather than fear. And instead of trying to control the world, feels united with the entire universe. She literally felt like she was the size of the universe, this vast intelligence. And it took her eight years to build back her ability to speak. I mean, she's a walking miracle that she can even function and she's highly functional. But um, she came back to say there's this, the connection with the universe is real. There's nothing... Our, our culture says the left hemisphere is real, the right hemisphere is not. And she says, no, other way around, the, the connection with all things is real. And quantum physics says that, you know, that we're all right. just part of one universal wave function and we're all just energy. And she experienced that. And so now she teaches about it. And as I was like chattering away about it online and whatever, she just called me to say, hey, and other people have called, I'm, I'm working on fear now. One of my favorite experts on fear is a guy named Gavin De Becker. I was writing a text to someone saying I should read his work from 20 years ago when a, an email popped up that said, hi, Martha, sorry to come in out of nowhere. This is Gavin De Becker. I was like, <laughs> not out of yeah. nowhere at all. <laughs> so yeah, animals, books, teachers, the very people you're thinking about, the more you are committed to your own truth, the more quickly and magically it seems to happen. Mm -hmm. And that kitty cat of yours. Yeah. She's the real deal. She's the real deal. I, I, um, and I, and it was a lot of synchronicity that led her here. And I, I, I just, I don't, I don't question any of it. And I, I think that when we, I think when, when you're saying the more integrity that we get into, it's also in my language, I might say the more blocks that we release to the presence of that integrity, yeah. the easier yeah. it is for us to establish a greater conscious awareness of all of yeah. the guidance that's around us. And yeah. so maybe that guidance is always there, but we don't see it. We're not capable of being able to even witness it. Yeah, I mean, we're capable, but we're socialized out of it. So the, when I say integrity, I just mean being whole and being aware of all the parts of you that are in operation. I don't mean you're bad. What happens is we're all born in integrity. And then as soon, before we can even talk, we confront social pressure not to express ourselves the way we want to. So that people are shushing kids and keeping them quiet and keeping them still. And the kid goes, oh, okay, there's something wrong with the way I am. And typically abandons parts of the true self in order to fit in socially. Right. So our society says, no, we can't feel spiritual impulses and things. Those aren't real. Those are woo woo, put them aside. But the fact is we do have the capability to do it. The way to come back into integrity is to look at anything that feels bleak, sad, miserable, frustrating, and see what you believe that's at the root of that that suffering and just ask yourself, am I sure that's true? So I felt alone, friendless, abandoned in a godless universe. The only thing certain was death and taxes. And then I started when I was about 18, asking myself, but am I absolutely sure that's the way it is? And I realized that I can't be absolutely sure of anything because everything is filtered through my perceptions and colored by my beliefs. So depending on what I believe, I see a different world. And I don't know which one is real. Mm -hmm. So I just decided to let go of it all and see what happened. And I've been doing that ever since more and more and more. And what happens is these floods of spiritual experience, spiritual companionship, the ever present love of some invisible, but incredibly tangible conscious force. It's, it's a wildly mystical existence and we have access to it. If we just drop our, socialization and yes. feel what we really feel. If you push yourself into absolute terror, which I did a lot, you actually create more traumas. Yep. 
Um, so what you want to do is stay within just a little short of the edge of your comfort zone. So the first thing I ask people to do is repeat, calibrate your sense of truth by saying there's one statement that I've coached thousands of people and they all told me this made them feel like it, it was true. And that statement is, I am meant to live in peace. So if you repeat that to yourself a few times, I'm meant to live in peace, I'm meant to live in peace. You, you may find, I mean, what happens to you when you say that to yourself? I want to just, I've heard you say that many times and I take it in and even first, even hearing you acknowledge and affirm that has a full body experience mm. for me. Mm. And I, I, uh, and then, so saying it or thinking it in this moment, I am meant to live in peace. It feels, I feel relief. Yeah. I feel, I believe that now. Mm. Mm. There may have been a time where I didn't. Even people who don't believe that they can live in peace, to say that out loud sort of aligns all the truth centers somehow. And uh, so once we've done that, the next thing is just to say the truth about how scared you are to find the truth. So say, I know there's stuff going on inside me, but I'm terrified to look at it mm -hmm. or whatever fits your particular case and stay there. That's it. That's, that's the step you need. It's and every step, you know, that takes a little courage and vulnerability to say, look, there's stuff I have to look at. I don't want to, but I know it's there. Um, that little step into vulnerability is the size of step you should be taking all the way through the inferno paradise the whole thing i call it one degree turns so mm -hmm. if you're in an airplane and you're going ten thousand miles and every half hour you turn one degree north you won't even notice the turn but you'll end up in a completely different destination like if you want to take three days and try not to lie or at least notice when you do even that has been shown in research to reduce the number of um, doctor visits that you have, the number of headaches, the, it increases your sense of well-being, your relationships. This is when they just take people and say, try not to lie so much for three days. Yeah. It, I mean, yeah. just, just, it, it's amazing how powerful this is. Right. Just thinking about all of the repressed rage and anger and mm. just all of that, that you push down when you lie. And for myself, you know, I've started practicing radical honesty and I've been uh, also practicing nonviolent communication. So it makes it a lot easier to tell the truth when you're just doing it in a, in a very compassionate and honest way. Right. I can't tell you how much easier it is to be, to run a business, to have, to have employees, to be a wife, yeah. to be a mother, when I'm just speaking from that seat of truth yeah. with, with just, just respect for the other. Um, mm -hmm. with no shaming and blaming, but yeah. just, just truth. I think that's probably one of the most transformational things I've ever experienced. If you like this video and you want to get more Gabby, check out the next one right over here.